Welcome to First United Methodist Church on this beautiful sunny day. We can start this worship service this morning. If uh, you would, let's bow for prayer and begin our service. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we meet this morning as a family in your presence. We meet as brothers and sisters in Christ and accepting the responsibility this places on each and every one of us. That is to love one another as you have loved us. To be light in a dark world. To do unto others as we would have them do unto us. To simply be your children. Draw us into your arms that we may fully know your love, your joy, and especially your peace in these troubled times. For in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. If you would stand as you're able, and our opening this hymn this morning is number 90, Ye Watchers and Ye Holy Ones. standing and let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in your bulletin and can also be found on 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. My name is Dale Cohen. I'm senior pastor here, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church. So glad that you're with us. And if you're visiting with us, we want to extend a very special word of welcome. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. This is a wonderful congregation. We believe that we exist to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God, meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. We would love for you to come and to be a part of the fellowship of this congregation. And I'll share a little bit more about what's going on in the life of our congregation. But at this time, I want to invite Emma and Matt and them to come on up. And Terry, if you'll come on down here. I will light the baptismal candle because we have a baptism today and if you will get the insert out of the bulletin. Carrie? and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God. What holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Emma and Matt, <clears throat> on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people everywhere? Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this family now before you in your care? With God's help, we will go order our lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. See me. And what name's given this child? Rowan Gregory, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being that through water and the Spirit you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go out here and see these people. Now it is our joy to welcome our new brother into the body of Christ. 
Through baptism, we are incorporated into the Holy Spirit, into God's new creation, and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of God. This child now belongs to us. As a church, we have a responsibility to love this child, to influence this child, to serve this child until such time as this child makes a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I think we're going to have a lot of fun doing it, too. <laughs> It's my privilege to welcome uh, this family, Matt and Emma, into our church. But I also want to invite Eva and Darren Crittenden to come forward. And the rest of the family can be seated. And Nancy, yes, Nancy, come on up. If y'all will come and stand here. Nancy is transferring her membership here, and Eva and Darren are making their way up here, and Matt and Emma. Matt is joining on Profession of Faith, and Eva is joining on Profession of Faith. In the promise, do you in the presence of God in this congregation renew the solemn vow and promise made at your baptism? Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Did you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament? Do you promise according to the grace given you to keep God's holy and will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as faithful members of God's holy church? All right, Eva. May the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Matt, if you'll kneel, please. Matt. May the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I invite Darren, Eva, and Matt uh, to become members of the United Methodist Church. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to Jesus Christ and serve him through the United Methodist Church by doing all in your power to strengthen its ministry? And to all of you, since y'all are just transferring into this congregation, but these are the vows into our church, will you faithfully participate in First United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Terry? Let's pray. Wonderful, amazing God, we gather as your children who have caught a glimpse of your glory and goodness. Your love has surrounded us from our birth and drawn us to yourself. Thank you for calling each of us into this community of faith called First United Methodist Church. Help us to love you, to love one another, to love your church, and to love the world with the love revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I will invite y'all back at the end of the service to come forward so that the congregation may greet you, but I hope that you'll welcome them now.
We've got a busy morning here at First United Methodist Church. I'm looking forward to hearing Terry's message again. He's got a great message on the transfiguration uh, that will both uplift and inspire you. And uh, uh, I know that we're grateful for his ministry among us. Uh, those of you who are on Facebook, our communications team has asked that whenever you come for worship, if you would check in on Facebook, because what that does is that raises our uh, visibility on Facebook in case somebody might be browsing Facebook and, and decide that they need to go to church somewhere. Uh, it could be that your uh, checking in here might be a prompt to get them to come and to worship here with us, and we would love that. Uh, the Shoals cluster of the Alabama Walk to Emmaus community is selling tickets for a spaghetti dinner and auction that will take place this Thursday evening um, in the atrium following worship. Uh, you can get tickets there. Uh, this will be at Tuscumbia First United Methodist Church on Thursday. The food will be great. There'll be some good auction items, and we would love for you to join us and help raise money for the Alabama Walk to Emmaus. This is becoming a broken record. Remember, the scripture says that a, a thousand years is to a day unto the Lord. Uh, evidently, that is true with Homeland Security and uh, our visa application for Alex Jones, our new organist. Um, they're continuing to uh, request information, and we're responding to that. And uh, if anybody knows Mo Brooks or Richard Shelby or Doug Jones and want to reach out and say, give us some help, that would be great. Um, I used to have Doug's cell phone number. He was a member of the church at Canterbury, uh, but all of a sudden I can't reach him anymore. I don't know what's <laughs> up with that. Uh, this afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m., uh, we will have our theological dialogue on human sexuality. Uh, if you're coming to that, please bring your Bible because we're going to be doing some digging into the Bible and uh, I also want you to know that the goal of this is not for anybody to be convinced, not for any debate to take place. Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, two sides to a very complex argument. Uh, anytime you try and reduce something to two different positions, uh, you risk offending everybody. And so, uh, if you show up this afternoon and you're not offended, I may not have done my job. <laughs> but would love for you to come, and there'll be opportunity for questions. Uh, we're going to ask, uh, because sometimes the way questions are asked can be loaded. Uh, we're going to give people an opportunity to write questions on a card, and uh, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you have. Um, it, is a, it is a deep uh, look, a deep dive into scripture and would love for you to come and to grow in your understanding, as I said, of this very complex issue. It has a tendency to divide us, uh, but my hope is that we can, even with divergent views, that we can still uh, see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Ash Wednesday begins this, uh, Lent begins this week with Ash Wednesday. On Wednesday evening, we'll have a service here in the sanctuary, service of the ashes at 6 p.m., and uh, there will be no supper. Uh, this uh, Ash Wednesday is typically a fast day in the church, and some may choose to fast, and so we will, uh, we will not have dinner that night, but the service will be in here at 6. I'm also happy to say that our day school has asked me to do a service of the ashes for the children uh, and their families. Uh, who would like to participate during the day on Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, we have a couple of studies that are coming up. Um, on beginning a week from tomorrow, Monday, March 2nd, uh, Sarah Hagstrom, Megan Smith Keenum, and Lisa Keys Matthews are hosting Resting in God, a Lenten experience. Um, there's no text for this. Uh, you just show up. Uh, and it will be Monday either at noon from noon to 1 or Monday evening from 5.30 to 6.15. And uh, they're offering it at two times so that uh, it can fit into a variety of people's schedules. And the class will offer you an opportunity to slow down 
and spend time in God's presence. Uh, in the class, you'll engage in scripture reading, prayer, and quiet contemplation during this holy season. Then on Wednesday evening, uh, following uh, the Ash Wednesday service, the weeks following, uh, I'll be leading a study on the unvarnished Jesus by Brian Zond. Uh, that book is a book of 46 devotions uh, that you read each of the days of Lent, and then we'll have some dialogue and discussion uh, when we gather on Wednesday evenings. And uh, the meals will resume uh, the following week, not this Wednesday, but the following week. Uh, please look at the worship bulletin for a host of other opportunities. Um, I'm so grateful for the many ways that you all demonstrate uh, commitment to this church. Uh, we have a speaker today uh, who is very committed to the Gideon ministry, and I'm inviting Mike Priesty to come forward at this time to share a couple of testimonies about what God is doing through the ministry that he's a part of. Mike? God's word saved me. I want to qualify right off. This is not my personal testimony. This was a testimony sent to the Gideons in Nashville. But somebody asked me after the first service whether or not that was my personal testimony, but it is not. It says, I went to the doctor one day. That sounds pretty normal, right? There's a lot you don't know from that statement, though. I was divorced and addicted to drugs and alcohol. I was broken and in need. While in the waiting room, I saw a Gideon Place Bible on the bookshelf. As crazy as it sounds, I felt it calling me. I didn't think twice. I got up and grabbed the Bible and opened it. In the front, I saw a title, Help in Times of Need, with appropriate Bible verses for each need. This spoke to me, so I went to the scriptures listed, and every word I read connected directly to my problems. I couldn't stop reading. Even during my exam, I could not stop thinking about the Bible. I thought about taking it home, but I couldn't steal the Bible. So I decided to leave it to leave without it. But the longing wouldn't leave me. It, per it persisted. I was racking my brain to try to think of what I should do. I did some research and found a nearby Gideon camp to call. The Gideon told me, go back to the doctor's office and take the Bible. You can't steal a Gideon Bible. It's a gift from God. I was baffled. Don't worry. He assured me, we'll replace it, the one that you take. I went back to my doctor's office and took the Bible. God's word saved me. And now I'm a Gideon myself. I don't know how God would work in through me, but I take personal workers' testimonies to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. My testimony is a picture of the beautiful work our Heavenly Father accomplishes in the brokenness of people. The Gideons International is an association of over 200,000 born-again Christian business and professional men. Since 1908, our purpose has been sharing the gospel with the world, word by distributing scriptures, and by personal witnessing to those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Presently, Gideon served the Lord in 200 countries, territories, and possessions. Last year alone, we distributed more than 85 million copies of God's Word around the world in 95 different languages. We place Bibles and New Testaments in the designated traffic lanes of life, places like hotels and motels, and convalescent homes. We also distribute New Testaments to the students in schools and colleges, to prisoners in jails and prisons, and to police, fire, and medical personnel, as well as men and women in the armed forces. The auxiliary are the wives of the Gideons, and they distribute Bibles to hospitals, nursing homes, medical offices, nursing graduations, abortion clinics, women's shelters, and female inmates in jails and prison. Thousands of Gideon testimonies 
tell how multiple lives have been changed from receiving a single copy of God's Word. Sometimes a whole family, other times an entire village. These testimonies document the truth of Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return on me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Share God's word and change lives. These few words really sum up what the Gideons International is all about. Andre was born in 1963 in the Soviet Union. His parents loved him greatly, and their influence led him to embrace the communist ideology. Andre grew up and was later admitted to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, where he served as an officer. He was awarded the military rank of captain and proudly kept the identity card of a member of the Communist Party in his left breast pocket of his military uniform. One day, a man, unintimidated by Andreu's status as an officer in the Soviet Army, approached him and gave him a New Testament from the Gideons. Andreu did not understand what to do with the gift, but he soon discovered the little book will fit in the pocket of his military uniform. Andreu placed the New Testament in his left pocket. Over the next year, Andreu read the Testament page by page. The Holy Spirit was working in his heart and in his life. By the time Andrea turned to the last page, he was ready to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. On June 27, 1992, at the age of 29, Andrea surrendered his life to Jesus. Soon after, he, re he joined a local congregation. God gave him a longing to share the hope of salvation to others. So Andrew joined the Gideons International and has now been serving as a member for 26 years. Iswari Pasad was raised in a Hindu family. Later he married and had three children. At some point his life took a turn for the worse. Iswari began to drink alcohol and, and lost consumption and lost concern for his family, which led to the demise of his marriage. Sometime after Iswari is, is and his boss, a Chinese, a Christian from Korea, stayed in a hotel during a business trip. Ziri confirmed, Ziri's boss called him from a different room and asked if he saw the Bible in his hotel room. He was surprised that his boss knew there was a Bible in the room. This intrigued him and he was drawn to read. The Holy Spirit began to work in Azuri's heart and life. When he returned to work, he asked his colleagues if they knew where he could get a Bible. God used the verse. Uh, a few days later, a Christian colleague gave him a new Gideon Testament that his daughter had received. Azuri read the New Testament and stopped at Matthew 18.8. The verse reads, And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. God used this verse to convict Azuri, and shortly after he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Soon after, God restored his family and they were all baptized. Today, Azuri serves as a national field director for the Gideons in Fiji. Right now, millions of lost people are in need of God's word, many of them right here in the United States. Some of them live down the street from this church and may not come to this service, so we must go to them. We need your help to continue to reach the students, to reach the hotels, and to reach countries around the world, starting with prayer. First, pray that we have open doors to distribute scriptures and a steady flow of funds to purchase and place scriptures and New Testaments in the coming months. Second, pray that we may have more men and wives join the Gideons International and help meeting the growing needs for distributing God's Word. And finally, pray those who receive God's Word today will not only open the Scripture, but will also they will open their hearts to Christ. Third, if the Lord has spoken to your heart today and the impact of His Word is making, make, making through His ministry, Please consider making a financial gift to the Gideons International. 
there is an insert, uh, Gideon insert, which has an envelope in it, and you can put your donation in that, or you can mail it to us if you want to, and put it in the plate. You can put the donation and mail it to us if you want to. <clears throat> Another way you can give to the Gideons is we have uh, Gideon uh, cards. It's an in-memory card, thinking of you card. It's in the North Annex. And all you have to do is send that to whoever you want to send it to and then send in a donation to the Gideons. The card doesn't cost anything, but we would appreciate any kind of donation. This is a unique and memorable way to touch thousands of lives with God's word with a simple greeting card. It's in the display is up there. Thank you, Dale, for the opportunity to share about the ministry of the Gideons International. We are simply an extended mission arm of your church, witnessing to the lost and distributing God's word across the globe. And right here at home, members of the congregation, it's been a privilege to participate in your worship service today. Please see me after service and, oh, if you are interested in becoming a Gideon, please see me after service and talk with and Thank you for your time. God bless you. Thank you, Mike. And when the offering is passed, you can place the, that envelope in there uh, with your offering as well as your registration card. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Loving God, we're so grateful for your many gifts to us, the gifts of family, friends, work, play, and worship. We honor you with the gifts we bring to your altar today. May these gifts go forth into the world, providing comfort and relief to those in need, hope for the discouraged, and life to those who struggle to live. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
You may be seated. We're going to skip the hymn today, and we'll go right to the pastoral prayer. We're going to do a bidding prayer today. I'll read through a phrase, and then I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and as a congregation, let us respond together, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for your peace. For those who are burdened with stress and anxiety, come into our turmoil, and may your presence give strength and calmness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your peace for those who suffer from the wounds of war, violence, and hatred. May we know healing and be inspired by the hope of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, we pray for your peace for all who bear ancient grudges or bitter hatreds held and nurtured over generations. Wash away the memory of hurt and neglect that we may know unity and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send your peace, Lord, that we may think, act, and speak harmoniously. Take away our selfishness so that we can share the joys and feel the sorrows of our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear and mercifully grant us, dear Lord, all that we ask that conforms to your good and perfect will for us. And now comfort us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This morning, our scripture lesson comes from 2 Peter, the first chapter, the 16th through the 19th verse. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we had made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from, the, come from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The word of the Lord.
Good morning, church. I'm glad to be with you. We are family. We are God's family. Let's pray together. Father, on this Transfiguration Sunday, may we look at this familiar passage with fresh eyes, knowing that you're still in the business of transformation. So be it. In the name of Christ, amen. There was a man named John Smith who developed a magic act. And since his name was John Smith, he changed his name to Merlin the Magician. And he developed this act, and late in his career, he got a really plum job. He became an act on a cruise ship. Now, he got a little lazy because he liked to go on the deck and lay around the pool and talk to people and eat the buffets. And he had found that since there was a different group of people on every cruise, he could just repeat his tricks, his magic. Well, the captain had a parrot. The parrot was smart. And the night that he did his magic act, among other acts, the captain's night, and the captain was always there with his parrot. Well, the parrot learned the tricks. He could see them, and the parrot would say, the card's up his left sleeve. <laughs> or the parrot would say, the flower's under the pot. Or the money's under his shoe. Well, he hated that bird. He didn't know what to do. He would make faces at it, hiss at it, but he couldn't lock it in a closet. He couldn't throw it overboard. He couldn't kill the bird because it was the captain's bird. So he didn't know what to do. It was getting harder and harder to develop new magic acts that the bird didn't know. Well, unfortunately, the ship blew up, and he found himself hanging on to a large piece of timber, and lo and behold, the parrot was sitting on the other end. And they glared at each other all day long. Well, the next day, the parrot finally said, Okay, what'd you do with the ship? <laughs> well, mystery, trickery, we're all drawn to it. We read mystery novels. We watch mystery TV shows and movies. We like watching magic acts. Well, this morning we have a text in the Bible, a mysterious event in the life of Christ that was not trickery. And this event tells us more about who Jesus, the man Jesus was. For about 2,000 years, various artists through art and sculpture have tried to represent Jesus in sculpture and art. And especially in museums, we see renditions of Jesus in sculpture and art. And it brings many people to worship and appreciate Jesus better. In the Renaissance, especially in Italy, this revival of learning brought artists like Raphael and Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Leonardo, who devoted their lives to depicting the acts and the life of Jesus. And many people were drawn to this. At the same time, books could be mass produced by the first printing machine. And the first book published was the Gutenberg Bible. So now for the first time, many people had access to the Bible as well as art that represented Christ on earth. Well, in Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 8, we read about a mysterious, magical event in the life of Christ. Listen to Matthew. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Now, notice it says after six days. Six days prior to this, Jesus had taken his friends to his apostles, his disciples, to Caesarea Philippi, which would be like us going to Las Vegas. It was not a holy place. There was a magnificent temple there built for Caesar Augustus. There were various idols worshipped there, particularly Pan, and it was a place where you went to worship idols. But he went there, and using the imagery around that scene, he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He finally got it. So then Jesus said, well, we're on our way to Jerusalem. And when we get there, I'm going to be killed and buried. And you'll witness many magical things, many special things. They just couldn't believe it. Peter said, no, no, Lord, that's not what's going to happen. And it says they were greatly distressed. So six days later, when we get to Matthew 17, Jesus is going to give them another way to know who he is, to instill in them the confidence that they can carry on this work that he has started after he's gone. So, after six days, Jesus took with him some of his apostles. While he was transfigured 
while he was there, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. And if you'll read this same story in some of the other Gospels, you'll read that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about what was going to happen in Jerusalem so the apostles would understand. It would be authenticated. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was talking, a bright cloud descended and covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. They fell to the ground. But when Jesus came and touched them, Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, there was no one there but Jesus. Now, the word transfigured here is an interesting word. The Greek word is metamorpho, and it means to transform or change. It's a verb that means to change into another form. And it can also mean to change the outside to match the inside. In the case of Jesus, it was to match the outside with the reality of who he really was. He was Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. The divine nature of Jesus was hidden in human form, and this transfiguration was a glimpse of that glory of who Jesus really was. Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets, but God clearly said, listen to him, my son, the one who is the new and living way. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So in this glorified form, they saw a preview of the coming glorification and the enthronement of Jesus as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the disciples never forgot what happened this day. And it was a inspiration for them the rest of their lives to be apostles, disciples, followers of Christ. John wrote it this way. He started his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. And then in verse 14, John said, the Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came to the Father, full of grace and truth. So John recounts that event of the transfiguration as being the inspiration for the rest of his life in following Jesus. As Dale read a while ago, or Calvin read a while ago, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, Peter also tells how this is an inspiration for him living the life of Jesus. Peter said, we didn't follow cleverly devised fables and tales when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. If he received honor and glory from God the Father, when the voice to him from the majestic glory said, This is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We heard this voice ourselves that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So this event fixed in the apostles' minds the fact that Jesus was truly the Son of God. Now, Jesus was transformed. Was he the only person that was transformed? Well, he wasn't. In the gospel accounts, we know that Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Peter, James, and John was there. And after Jesus changed in appearance, Moses and Elijah disappeared. Peter was talking before he was thinking, like he usually did. And he said, I tell you what, let's build three huts, three tents, three brush arbors, whatever he had on hand. One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And then the cloud descended, and God's tremendous voice said, This is my son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, transfigured means transformed, changed. We know that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God on earth. We know that God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So who was transformed? Peter, James, and John saw some great event here. But when it says his countenance was altered, I think that means also that the perception of Jesus that Peter, James, and John had was changed that day. They truly came to know that Jesus was 
the Son of God. So they now understand the story of the transfiguration. The real impact is about grace and its effect on our lives. It was by grace that these disciples, Peter, James, and John, were able to see Jesus Christ in a new and deeper reality. And we too, the church, is offered that same mountaintop experience, the view of Christ. In baptism, we receive grace. And other than being wet, we don't look any different. But we're transformed. Jesus has given both spiritual birth and the process of spiritual growth of us through the mutual action of two principles. God gives us grace through the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other one is opening our hearts to receive that grace so that we can truly become one with God. Now, Jesus came to offer us a new way of living. We've studied the Beatitudes, and Jesus said things like, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are the merciful. Happy are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Talking about a whole new way of life for us. As people of God, we are not settlers. We're pioneers. We come from a long tradition of pioneers. All of us came to this country from somewhere. You may be first generation. Your family may have come here in the 19th century or the 18th century or the 17th century. But they were called, our ancestors, out of their surroundings and they went somewhere new, somewhere different, to do something new, to live differently. And we see that all through God's dealings with people. Noah was called to build an ark, to prepare for a flood, and it never rained. Abraham was a successful 75-year-old farmer who was asked by God to go to a place that God would show him. Leave your home, leave your family. I'll show you where to go. He went, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Moses was a rancher with livestock. Moses asked, or God asked Moses to go back to Egypt and lead his people out of slavery to the promised land. These men and other men and women have been called to things that seem impossible but we're powered by the Spirit of God. Now, we get into trouble when we become settlers instead of pioneers. The Hebrews complained in the wilderness. Israel wanted a king to be like everybody else. The people wanted a temple and not a tent in which to worship. But God wants pioneers. God wants people that would leave the comfort of their settled life and do something different, to go somewhere different, to live differently to undertake missions that we don't know anything about. God's word to Peter, James, and John resonate with us. Listen to him. Follow him. Obey him. He is your Lord and master. The power of God's grace can and will transform us just like it did Peter, James, and John. God has given each of us gifts that combined with the love of Jesus, we can feel life, we can live life in a whole different way. Life is a journey with a blessed destination, and Jesus invites us to walk with him. Let Jesus transform your life. He will change. He will transform us. See Jesus as he is, the son of the living God. Hear him. May the word of God dwell in our hearts and make us rich in every way. Let's stand, turn in your hymn to number 453, and we will sing together, More Love to the O Christ. <clears throat>
families like to stand up here during the benediction? Yeah, Nancy and Matt and Emma and Darren and Eva, if y'all will come forward, please. Take the name of Jesus with you everywhere, every day, in every way. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, 